And I have always looked at my career as a river, that I'm flowing through life and sometimes I have encountered rocks, sometimes I have turned around and taken a scenic bend, but there's always been that dream that there's an ocean ahead. I was born in a value system where you never thought of yourself as an individual only, but you saw yourself as part of a grander narrative, a quest that there were people who had come before you and there were people who will come after you. Success was not defined as a resume of achievements. Success was defined as an absence of failure. As long as you don't fail in your dharma, in your duty, small or big, you're a success. And in that, the inspiration comes from the role models that you have. My father grew up in extremely humble circumstances, again because of an accident of birth. But he was perhaps the first person to get admitted to the Imperial College of Science in England. And the British resident came to him and said, here is the telegram. There was so much excitement that this boy coming from a family that was best described as genteel poverty was now going to go to London. Two weeks later, another telegram came. This one saying, Mr. Call, by the time you leave Kashmir and come to Bombay and take the steamer to London, you'll probably miss the early part of the semester. Now that we have admitted you, why don't you take time and prepare properly and come next year? All's well. That made sense. The British resident told my father that the time could be spent wisely. We all, my father and everybody agreed. And as he was waiting excitedly next summer in anticipation of heading out to London, the Kabali raiders came from Pakistan. It was time of partition and my father had to leave Srinagar and come as a refugee to Delhi. I think of my grandfather who sat for a bureaucratic exam in the state of Jammu and Kashmir and he did not pass that competitive exam. He emerged as probably one of the greatest souls of India. He was probably, after Jawaharlal Nehru, the first person from Kashmir whose works were covered by the New York Times and who had a lengthy obituary that was covered in the New York Times. When I was getting my MBA at the University of Chicago, we used to, on campus, invite CEOs of various corporations. We had invited the CEO of Dow Chemicals to come. He came and he gave us talk. And when he came out, there was a group of students, not from the business school, but a group of students who came and surrounded him. And they were very critical of the role that Dow Chemicals had played in the Vietnam War. And I remember him looking at the students and one of the students shouted at him and said, you think you run the world, don't you? And he very humbly replied back, I don't run the world. I just help keep the world running. I was very fortunate in my career. I ended up being amongst, I think, only the first five Indo-Americans who rose up to run a publicly traded corporation irrespective of titles, irrespective of mission, irrespective of my role, I've always seen myself as an enabler. This young American Peace Corps volunteer came to our school and the principal asked him and said, what can you teach? And he said, well, I can teach new math. And the principal said, okay, go ahead, teach new math. After two weeks of that teaching, and I was his student, all the parents stormed angrily into the principal's office. They couldn't understand what this new math was. It certainly wasn't going to help their kids score high in the competitive exams. 
this had to stop. <laughs> Our poor principal didn't know what to do. So he went to this gentleman and he said to him, he said, Don, is there anything else that you can teach? And Don thought about it for a minute and he said, I can teach them basketball. And the principal said, what is basketball? And Don said, well, it's, it's a very popular sport in America. And the principal said, well, what do you need? He said, well, I, I don't really need much. I just need a place, a piece of land. Because of my height, I get selected to play basketball. I played basketball then in college. I played the guard position. And as part of the guard position, my role was basically to be a playmaker, to feed the ball, to help our players on the team score high and win. My career has taken me into many different directions, much the way a river flows. We were very idealistic. Intuitively, we knew that the entire nation was sacrificing so that we could study and get a world-class education. So I was the first president of India gold medalist at the Haley Public School. I went to IIT Haley. When I graduated, I was a gold medalist there. I got recruited personally by Rusi Modi from Tata. So when I made the decision to accept a scholarship at Brown University, it wasn't. I, I, I did not come to America for opportunity. I had opportunity in India. I came to America because I was a dreamer. I came to America because I, was, I had ideals. And when I came to Brown University, I was the first Indian to work on solar energy. I was working there, helping do research to make solar cells for NASA space program. And what drove me was a very simple thing, which is if someday a solution can be found for renewable, sustainable energy that is widely and cheaply available, countries like India, Africa, and Asia could transform themselves. And it was those ideals, those dreams that steered me in my choices. I switched from technology because I realized that there was something even greater than technology and that was the consumer, the power of a human being. So I decided to get my MBA. I got admitted to Harvard, Stanford, University of Chicago. Uh, I got the Leo Carroll Marshall Fellowship at Chicago, went there and it was wonderful. And then I decided to go into consumer products uh, and then I rose up the ranks eventually served as CEO, went into private equity, and now I work with young entrepreneurs, help incubate new ventures, and in all of this, I have worked on those things that in one way or the other, I have found interesting, big or small, those things where I feel goodness will come out of it, Always something that has kept me very humble is my mother and my wife. My mother was a school teacher. She was teaching in a part of Haley where the girls came from very humble backgrounds. But over the course of a lifetime, she transformed the lives of 12,000 young girls. And it used to be amazing to me that when I would occasionally go with her to the market to do shopping and we would walk, uh, she would be walking slowly because she was aged by then and I would walk with her. Suddenly, car would stop, windows would roll down and there would be a voice inside the car saying, Madam, 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 do you remember me? Please come in my car, I'll take you home. And my mother would smile and say, no, my driver is waiting. <laughs> and yes, I remember you. And yes, I'm glad to see you. And it's nice to see how well you're doing. And then, of course, my wife. I mean, she's a pediatrician. She's a pediatric doctor. Is available 24 by 7. When young mothers who've given birth to babies 
get an anxiety attack. <laughs> you know, they don't care. They call at 2 a.m., they call at 3 a.m., they want doctor call now. It's their most precious possession, their baby. And so, you know, you look at your, I look at my mother, I look at my wife, and I realize at the end of the day that uh, I may have served as a CEO, I may have had many roles in business, in technology, but at the end of the day, it's the people who touch human lives, who build human lives, like my wife, like my mother, that actually build humanity. Namaskar. My name is Sushma Kaul. I was born in Srinagar, Kashmir. Grew up in Kashmir until I was 17. Lived in a joint family. Lived with my grandparents, my parents, my uncles, aunts, cousins. We were like about, for Western ideas, it was like a mini community, about 20 people, each time for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It was a very nurturing family, loving, caring. We learned how to share. We learned how to care for each other. Uh, you know, helped each other in any ways. My, some of my cousins were good at certain things and I was good at some other things. So we kind of learned how to work together. And um, so until I was 17, um, then I got an admission for my medical school in uh, Delhi. Uh, Lady Harding and uh, moving from Kashmir to Delhi was a big decision. I mean, I was not a decision maker. My job was only to get an admission. The decision was to be made by the family and it was a big debate. Uh, a lot of people got involved whether we should send our daughter away. Ultimately, um, my grandfather took a stand. He said, Tathastu, she will go. I had never been to Delhi really. I had been only up to Jammu. This was the first trip to Delhi and that to going to Delhi, my school started in July. It was so hot and we lived with the family, friends, my father and me. Coming from Kashmir, everybody would say, oh Kashmir ki kali aagaye, Kashmir ki kali. It was like a big thing. Uh, but uh, I think what kept me going honestly real was uh, my grandfather's statement, I always remember that, that it was like a Lakshman Rekha for me. I could never cross that. I cannot do this, I cannot do that. So that's how I finished my medical school. Then I went back to Kashmir, wanted, you know, just to be with the family for some time. And then I came back and did my post-graduation at All India Institute of Medical Sciences. A lot of my friends were getting married and stuff like that. So I wanted to get married too, I guess. But my father was very insistent. He says, no, she has to do MD. Before, you, you cannot get married. You have to do the post-graduation. Then only we will see, then you'll get married. So one day, my future in-laws, my father-in-law, my mother-in-law, and there was somebody else with them. They came, I was in a clinic working, and they came and they said to me they needed some help. Somebody was sick or something, and they needed my help. So I said, okay, I know, you know, they spoke in Kashmiri, and we talked, and I was very helpful to them. And then I found later on, they actually were not, nobody was sick. <laughs> <laughs> they were looking for a bride for their son. <laughs> His mother was very loving, and she used to come to my hostel a lot. And then one day she showed me Rakesh's photograph. You know, this is my son. And she brought a photograph, he playing volleyball in America. It was like, oh, boy, oh, I was so impressed. I said, ooh, I got to meet this guy. <laughs> so that's how when he came, I met him. And then a few years later, we got married. And that's how I ended up in America. I had come to India uh, from the US and she told me uh, about Sushma and I went to meet Sushma and her parents were supposed to come and sort of chaperone her but because the weather was very bad in Kashmir the plane couldn't take off mm. so what to do so my mother said okay you know she's a single woman 
uh, it would not be appropriate. Uh, but what you can do is you can go visit her, just visit her only for 15 minutes on campus and then leave. And I said, okay, because those were the social mores of that time. So I went to campus, I met her only for seven minutes, because after seven minutes, I knew that I was going to marry her. We had somebody used to work for us who used to occasionally carry a care package from my mom to Tell Sushma. Mm. And so he knew where her dorm room was. And I, he took me and from the downstairs, he pointed out her room on the second floor. He said, Sahib, that's, that's her room and it's the first room after the staircase. I said, okay. So I uh, walk up the staircase and I go to the door and I knock on the door. And she opens the door, looks at me, and I get to look at Sushma for the first time in my life. And there we are looking at each other and then she slams the door shut in my face. <gasps> I'm just standing there looking at the closed door. <laughs> I, I kind of didn't know what to, what to do. I hear some sounds inside, some hurried sounds. And then she reopens the door a couple of minutes later. And what she had done, which I suppose it took me a while to figure out, well, she was a student. She was just cleaning up a room before letting me in. He came a little too early. <laughs> he came a little. You know, you used to live in a. It's a in the same room. You have your own bed. You have a table. You have a chair. You have a little. You know, small refrigerator. Whatever. A couple of chairs to sit on. So uh, I think he came a little bit, <laughs> a little bit early. Our older son was born in California. Both, actually, both were born in California. One was in Orange County, the older one. Actually, he was born, I was doing my residency. I had just started my, I was seven months pregnant when I started my residency. So basically, was up 24, 36 hours at a stretch. So he was born in California, in Orange County. He grew up, we were there for three years, three more years. And then uh, the younger one was born in San Francisco, Druva. And um, they both grew up in California for until they were like seven, eight years old. Then moved to Midwest. Midwest was really good, Minneapolis for them. I think uh, that was the best place for them to grow up and, uh, you know, develop some family values and see how families work together, you go into the people's homes, you, you make really deep relationships. So that was a good place for them to grow up. And then they moved to, moving to New York was very tough. They really did not want to come. Whatever, they made so many excuses. You know, we tried to get into them into the Pingree school in Summit area. They misbehaved there <laughs> because they didn't want it. The school teacher says, oh, they don't want it. I said, well, they, she says, we can't have them here in the school because you know, I don't think so they like it here. I said, of course, they don't want to be here because they don't want to come to New Jersey. But anyway, then we were here at Dwight Anglewood School, which uh, they liked it. They did very well there. Now our older son is doing his PhD at com in computer science at Carnegie Mellon. And the younger one is working. He did his, uh, he went to NYU Stern and then he did his MBA at Harvard. And now he's working in Boston. He works for a private equity firm. The older one is uh, Shiva is doing his PhD and he has, he's very, um, research-oriented, very deep thinker, and um, he's pretty tough on himself. I mean, he does not like things to come easy to him, and he has to learn everything by himself. And he has been always like that from day one. And they are both, uh, they played sports, very active, in soccer, music. Um, my Shiva, we used to play violin and uh, chess, 
lot of activities. I have tried a lot, uh, but uh, they have developed the base core, core values are good. But you know, they live in America, they have to, they have to, it's kind of sometimes tough, I feel bad. They have to balance between the two. They have to please Indian community and then they have to go out and please the Western community, American community. So it's kind of a, for them, I think it's a tougher job. From my perspective, I'd answer it in, uh, at two levels. Uh, one, to the degree that there were, and there are important, some scars, like for example, uh, we did the sacred thread ceremony for both the boys, and I was, I'm sure Sushma, you agree, that they both went into it surprisingly, extremely willingly. Yeah, they had a little bit uh, initially difficult time, but then the moment they had to sit there for the prayer, Wow, they change. You know, when you have to change into that special, those special clothes, yes. something happened. Yes. Something happened. They say, okay, we are ready now. So, and you have to sit in front of the Yagnya fire for about, what, they eight, Seven, eight hours, yeah. yeah. And they were very much into it. I look at our culture is, our culture has two aspects to it. One is the universal values. Uh, and the other is uh, the tribal values. Uh, they may not uh, place that much importance yeah. to the tribal aspect and to the ritualistic aspect that binds the tribe together. But I am uh, very pleased that in terms of the universal aspects, you know, mm. the search for knowledge, the search for truth, the search for uh, beauty in life, uh, the search for uh, something that's higher, uh, I think both Shiva and Dhruva are very much aligned with that. And uh, what makes me extremely happy, extremely happy as a uh, Kashmir Shavite uh, who believe in the oneness of humanity, uh, uh, both her sons uh, are completely without prejudice. That to me, is the manifestation of our culture at its highest level. And that makes me feel very, very good. Right around the time of spring, uh, we had a festival called uh, Madan Trayodashi. And Madan is the god of love, and uh, Trayodashi is... Uh, so, now, listen carefully how it used to be celebrated in Kashmir. Uh, the night before, uh, the husband, the husband would get a big pitcher, and in those days they used to have those huge pitchers, and he'd fill it up with water, and he would put it with, he would put flowers in it, and uh, he would arrange for a picture of Kama, the god of love, and uh, in the morning, uh, both uh, husband and wife would wake up, and the husband, was supposed to give a bath with a body scrub using that fragrant yeah. water. <laughs> give a nice, nice body scrub and shower uh, to his wife. And uh, then they were supposed to pray to the God of love. And then they were supposed to uh, go out to the gardens uh, and picnic and have fun and then they were supposed to come back in the evening and then they were supposed to have fun. So this was love of <laughs> Kashmiri style. Those days, not Those now days. anymore. <laughs> but but, 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 but I, I'm going to share a second wicked story because I don't want these things to only get be about serious stuff, right? Uh, people, uh, people are uh, human beings wherever they are. And the second thing I'm going to share with you is about how weddings used to be in ancient times. Yeah. So in really ancient times uh, when uh, uh, the bride and the groom would get married, uh, just like the big fat Indian wedding today, you'd have many guests. And each guest uh, would get a plate in which they would eat their food. Uh, the regular guests, the plate would be made of clay. 
and uh, of course in the case of the bride and the groom it would be made out of silver and uh, the plate would be filled with food <laughs> and when you finished eating the food out of the plate voila what do you find at the bottom of the plate what you find at the bottom of the plate is a couple making love and that would be uh, on the silver plates too and you were supposed to take those plates and put them in your bedroom to basically uh, recognize and accept that the purpose of a marriage was that it was the beginning of love and it was the beginning of the formation of life and that life is to be celebrated you know when i came to america i was very excited you know i was newly married and came here and was but when i reached los angeles landed there i got very anxious i said oh, oh what did i do <laughs> different country left everybody back home all my friends relatives my god what am i doing here eventually i made some good friends uh, just my neighbor you know you used to live in an apartment um, in orange county you know, in irvine and made a very good friend an american girl who came and she said oh i, I guess i was doing laundry or something so she, i met with her and boy she just uh, took such good care of me she became my good friend she showed me how americans live you know what how to dress up where to go shopping what kind of shoe you know everything really i mean even uh, like things like even how to put the makeup on it was like you know because i was home those days and became a good friend even though you know going to california was um, to start my career um, in california was tough those days and people would not get into residency especially the foreign medical graduates the uh, everybody my chief chief of the pediatrics where i really wanted to do the residency at uc irvine um she was she would openly say i do not want any foreign medical graduates i do not like them i don't want them but so she, her secretary would always tell me no she doesn't want to meet you Then I found a nice friend librarian who became my friend and I said okay um, show me who Dr Morgan is and when she passes by I would like you to point out to me and uh, Dr Morgan when she met with me um, she was very happy she says you know I have to change my mind uh, she was very helpful she wrote such wonderful uh recommendations after about uh, for me after i did my residency in her program uh so i i never felt that way in my profession um you know as a physician i i am practicing uh, pediatrics for a long time so many americans would say uh, we prefer indian doctors they're very caring they're very nurturing i've been in this country for 46 years and i look at the exchange between me and americans and i as part of my career got to live in different parts of the country lived in providence rhode island chicago southern california northern california <laughs> minneapolis and now new york new jersey uh, so i have encountered a vast swath of people starting from the moment i landed in this country uh, when i went to brown university uh, the university had a wonderful foreign students host family program uh, i met kenan by nalman through that program and they were remarkable in helping me orient to America as a society not as a classroom uh, they would bring me to their home i celebrated my first thanksgiving with them and i learned a lot about what an american family is all about living in this society uh, overall i would say uh, it is certainly the best 
society in the world at an individual level, at a collective level. Uh, when I certainly compare it to the place where both Sushma and I come from, where our community faced genocide on January 1990 and everybody in our community had to flee and we lost our land and we lost our heritage and now are unable to go back. Uh, I must confess that uh, America, by contrast, is a place uh, that was very welcoming, where I had mentors who unabashedly supported me and nurtured me and I did the same. And so they helped me become successful. And I take great pride that uh, people who were uh, people that I was cheerleader to uh, today are occupying the highest offices in the land. And the day-to-day -day interaction has been extremely, extremely uh, positive. What has happened is, unfortunately, that uh, the current climate uh, has become one where, for a variety of reasons, hate gets amplified and goodness uh, observes modesty. And uh, one has to therefore be remarkably centered, remarkably centered that one not deviate because of the hate, but one be focused on the goodness. And if one builds that network of good people around them, then I think one discovers that Human beings can be even greater than gods. I was at IIT Bailey. I wanted to essentially help accelerate the ability for telecommunications. So at that time, we used to only have All India Radio. And it was an AM station. And I read about something called FM that had come out in America, but FM stations were very expensive. I did more research and there was somebody who had come out with this relatively new technology at that time. So I built India's first FM digital sigma modulator broadcasting station. The second one, which was even crazier, was that I built probably one of the earliest linear induction electromagnetic guns. And uh, it was quite an adventure and I built it and then eventually it was put on display at the convocation when the President of India came. Uh, he came accompanied with his uh, military adjutant. I think they were very struck by it because a couple of weeks later they came to the institute and just took it away <laughs> with them. And uh, I don't know what uh, I don't know what happened uh, after that. In this country, uh, there were 35 to 40 million people who did not have access to a credit card. And a credit card in America is in some ways even more important than a driver's license. Just imagine, uh, if you don't have a credit card, you can't make a reservation at a hotel. Even if you want to go there and say, I'll pay you cash, they won't accept it. So we started the very first credit card company that was focused on what's called the unbanked market and very quickly it ran up to three billion dollars in valuation but most importantly uh, it uh, gave access to uh, people who were not part of the economic system 
and that was inclusion uh, at the at the highest level and we use technology data mining technology to essentially manage the risk of this unknown population because they were not on any credit bureaus or databases and we use the uh, power technology for good so these are some examples of you know going into the darker darker areas darker spots and saying how can i come in take some risks and you know empower people my journey led me to the great collections of stories that were produced in india uh, the panchtantra of course being a remarkable collection about the wise conduct of life. Stories that teach young children how to live life. There's of course another beautiful collection, the Somadeva's Kathasar Sagar or Ocean of Stories. And that then led me to an even greater discovery that it is in India that over the course of a thousand years there was developed this whole art and science of story writing founded around the construct of rasa. There are nine rasas, you heard of rasas in music, but rasas are very much the building blocks of great stories. Uh, Mahabharat, for example, is written in the Shantras. And so, this was a whole new universe that opened up. But today, when people write about their stories, they are merely, in a very contemporary way, reflecting a learning that goes back 10,000 years. The novel, The Last Queen of Kashmir, started in a very innocuous manner. I was researching the last name of my wife, which is Dhar. Just was curious as to what the antecedents of that family name were. And I ran into the story of Birbal Dhar around the year 1800. He was the most prominent Kashmiri Pandit aristocrat of Kashmir at a time when it was ruled by Afghans. Unfortunately, the governor of that time, a gentleman by the name of Azim Khan, was vicious and his horrific actions had turned the Muslims and the Hindus against him. They jointly came to Birbal Dhar and asked him to do something. And he thought and thought and realized that their only savior could possibly be Maharaja Ranjit Singh. So he and his son left one night and through hidden trails crossed over the mountains of Kashmir to go to the court of Maharaja Ranjit Singh. He left his beautiful wife and even prettier daughter-in-law hidden in the custody of his milkman. When Azam Khan discovered that Birbal had disappeared, he knew right away what was up and he put out an order to his troops that they should ransack the valley to find out where the family could possibly be hiding. When Birbal reached Maharaja Ranjit Singh, the Maharaja gave him a fair hearing but being a fairly pragmatic Maharaja, he decided to think about it and took one year to think about whether he should come to the rescue of the local Kashmiris. 
During this time, sadly, a jealous family member by the name of Tilak Chand Munshi betrayed the secret of where these two women were located. Azam Khan's troops rushed in. They grabbed the daughter-in-law who was eventually shipped to the harem in Afghanistan. And one feels sad thinking about what happened to her. The mother-in-law managed to swallow poison. And her last words were, there will always be a Kota Rani. Remember me to my husband. Thus began my journey. There was nothing about her. She had been hidden away. It took me seven years to research, three years to write, the whole project took 12 years from end to end. But once the story came to life, I discovered that Kota Rani is the greatest queen of the land. And as her people describe her, always captivating, but never captive. If you like the story of Chhatrapati Shivaji, you will be in awe of Kota Rani, the last queen of Kashmir. The story of the Tengapura Durga was relayed to me at a dinner in New York City in 2011 by Dr. Pradipatya Paul, the foremost living authority on Indian art and culture. He has written over 60 books, published several papers. And he told me sternly, Rakesh, this Durga is the oldest continuously worshipped Durga in the subcontinent. It was stolen by a band of zealots, criminals, turns out the greatest art smuggler in the world. It found its way into New York City and then eventually into a museum in Germany. But there's nothing you can do about it because India doesn't have any track record of recovering its sacred assets. But I told Dr. Paul, I said, I give you my sacred oath. I will do whatever I can and leave no stone unturned to recover this murti. Suffice to say, it took me many years, but along the way, many supporters emerged. Every obstacle was overcome. And I'm delighted to say, that in 2015, when Chancellor Angela Merkel flew to India for her first meeting with the newly elected Prime Minister Modi, accompanying her in her private plane was the Tengapura Durga, which she personally handed over to Prime Minister Modi as Germany's gift back to India.